the timing of having me speaking straight off to Pete, I think might be inspired. <laughs> because uh, Pete has such a big vision and he looks so far into the future. And uh, I'm going to draw your attention to small detail and I'm going to make you look into the past. So um, I hope that the two come together by the end of it all. But I'd like to draw your attention to the cross. It's been something that's been troubling me for quite a long time. I've been thinking about the cross for the last two months in a more detailed way. And for me, the, the part that's troubling is that Jesus comes into the city and he knows that he's about to die. He knows it. That's why he, he has the last supper with his disciples. He says, take and eat. He's prophesying about his coming death. He knows it's going to happen. So the part that concerns me is when he comes into the Garden of Gethsemane and he's so troubled, he's so full of turmoil. The tension is palpable and he says, Father, take the cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And then he sweats blood and I don't know if that's a metaphor, but I, I can't get it away from my mind how the intensity is just enormous. Mm -hmm. And because I'm somebody who looks back, I know a lot of church history. And in church history, many people go to their death rejoicing, full of joy. My best story is with Latimer and Ridley, these two people who burnt at the stake. And Latimer turns to Ridley and he says, Brother Ridley, be of good cheer. Today we will be together in paradise. Why is it that, that these disciples of Jesus are full of joy and yet Jesus is full of turmoil. He's full of tension. It's palpable. Why is that happening? Were they people of greater faith than Jesus? Were they more courageous than Jesus? Now I know what's going to come about is, is it's going to be this terrible betrayal. The desertion of his disciples. I know that he's going to have this false trial, this mockery of a trial. I know he's going to be handed over to the enemy. There's nothing nice about the story. But there were other people in history who went down the same path and they did it with joy. And yet there's this tension. And then he comes to the cross and he's on the cross and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the sky is darkened and the earth shakes. And the temple curtain is torn in two. And then at the end of it all, with a sigh, he says, It is finished. Why was there so much tension around his death and other people in history have gone to their death rejoicing? Why was it that even Paul said, for me, uh, uh, to live as Christ, to die as gain? Why was that? And the answer is obvious because all of the other things that happened by men, that's not the gospel story. The gospel story is that God the Son would be separated from God the Father. And that the wrath of the Father for the sins of the many would be poured out on the one. And in that terrible moment, he faced the death that none of us ever faith, face. Because we will go to the judgment time where we'll go with confidence. And not one drop of that confidence is in ourselves. But all of that confidence is in Jesus because he said, it is finished. So when I come to speak to you this morning... It is in the context that it is finished. We have been redeemed. There's an amazing phenomenon that accompanies the gospel. Is that when people are touched by the message of Jesus and what he did on the cross, they changed. So within the church what you find is people who better fathers. What you find within the church is they better husbands. And what you find, which is unique to the Christian church, which you do not find in any other theology in the world, is that people begin to work. And they begin to work for the glory of God. And I want to say to you that right from the beginning, God created us with the intention that we should work. In the beginning, in the Garden of, of Eden, He blessed them and blessed them with work. He gave them lordship of the animals and of the trees and of the seeds and all of the things that you are doing. And yet we know in the, in the Garden of Eden that it was not long before they said, but did God really say? Is God 
the boss of me? Is he the one who determines what I do? And in that, this rebellion that all of us inherited and that we all take with us from the time that we're born to the time of the grave. And so we see the curse of work. That within work, we have to be through the sweat of our brow, get thorns and thistles. And that's the dilemma that all of us have, isn't it? Is that we live in this world, we can see the blessing of work, but we also feel the curse of work. And what happened on the cross, when Jesus said it is finished, is He liberated us to enjoy work and to find it a blessing again. So I want to say to all of you, God doesn't need our work and He doesn't need our money. He's absolutely sovereign. He can do whatever He wants to do, whenever He wants to do it. He desires from us that we're godly in our work and that we're godly in our money because He wants the best for us. There's this amazing thing in the Christian faith, isn't there? Is that when we honor God most, is when we are most happy. I speak a lot of child, uh, to children, and I always say to the children, I know who's the happiest in the room. The one who loves God and serves Him is the happiest in the room. And it applies to adults as well. So the basis of what I'm saying to you today is the reason we have a godly perspective and a biblical perspective of work because it honors God most and it makes us most joyful. <coughs> so to get it in perspective, I just want to go to a story that you all know so well. And it's the story of when the, when the Pharisees and the Herodians come to Jesus and they want to trap him. They want to catch him out. They want to have one of those gotcha moments. And so in Mark chapter 12 and verse 13 to 17, we come to this amazing text where it says, Later they sent some Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not, should we pay it or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me, let me look at it. They bought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Isn't it quite an intriguing story? Because on the one hand, he comes to the coin and he says, well, whose inscription is there? If you know your history, that was Augustus. Augustus Caesar. And he was dressed up to look like a, a god, like a, a god with a small g. And that was the inscription on the coin. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. The image of Caesar is on the coin. Give that to Caesar. I don't know, I'd like to find a way around it because I don't enjoy that teaching, but I think it's saying to all of us, pay your taxes. Quite simple. But anyway, I don't think that's the big message. Because the big message has to be, well, where's God's image? What is it that we're supposed to give to God? So in light of what happened on the cross, that we were purchased at a price, that we were dead and in our transgressions, that we were dark uh, blind and in the dark and Jesus pulled us out of that because of what he did on the cross what are we supposed to give to Jesus where is his inscription where is the image of God who was created in God's image you see I don't think we can have the right context for work or for money until we know where God's image is and of course God's image is supposed to be on our hearts and on our minds and on our souls and we're supposed to give all of ourselves to God wholeheartedly. And when we do those things, when we start at the beginning, when we have the presupposition or the root in the right place, then all of the other things come into being. So I would be challenging you today, if, you've, if you're quite new in the faith or you've been for 40 years like me or maybe 60 years like Brian, I would say to you, today is the day again where you say, where's God's image? 
Have I given him everything? Because once he has your heart, he desires that your work and your money are for his glory and for your delight. So I come to you as somebody outside of Foundations for Farming. And again, as I say to you, because I love history, I think it's an amazing revival. I, I've known Brian a long time and I've known Craig a long time and Pete and Scott and Matt, I've got to know you more recently. And I'm sure what you're doing from the inside and all of you people out, out in, the, in the bush, you see the gritty detail. You have to, have to deal with this murky world with all of its problems. And it sometimes might be difficult for you to see outside. But I'm looking in. I come and I visit once every two years. And every time I come back, I think to myself, this is a revival. May I even take one more step and say, maybe it's a reformation. Because it's interesting to me that when the gospel affects a man or a woman, they change. Their lives change, their families change, their businesses change, and eventually their communities change. And that's what reformation is. You see, but it starts back to the individual. I want to draw you back to the small thing. It's where your heart is. Is your heart being given over to Jesus in full? Because that's where it starts. And that's what starts the Reformation. And you see, unique to, to us from any other ideology in the world is that we believe that work is a blessing. And it distinguishes us. And so when people look in from the outside and they see us that we have a godly attitude to work and we have a godly attitude to money, that they can see there's been a change. I'm going to just go quickly because now that we have that attitude, and I know I don't have a hang of a lot of time, I was interested to read about uh, John Wesley and his attitude to money. As Brian knows, I'm more of a follower of Whitfield than a follower of Wesley. But it was interesting to me when I looked at Wesley and he came up with three things that he said you should do with your money. He said the very first thing you should do, you should feed your family. Now feeding our family means much more than just putting a meal on the table. It might mean a whole lot of other things. It might mean clothing them, giving them a house. It might be educating them. All of those things he would put under the category of feed your family. Well, that makes sense. But then he came to a second point and he said, pay your debts. That was his second point, pay your debts. Do not live in debt. Do not have a cloud of debt over your life. You will not be free to do all the other things that you could do in God's kingdom when you have debt. This is this man of God, this practical man of God who loved Jesus and he said, Feed your family, number one. Number two, pay your debts. And then finally, he said, feed the church. And so his example is an extraordinary example, isn't it? Because here was this man who got a job at Oxford University. He got paid $30, 30 pounds a month. Uh, 30 pounds a year, actually. But it was 200 years ago. In today's terms, it would probably be about $30,000. He found out that he could live on 28 pounds. So he used 28 pounds to live and he gave two pounds to the church. The next year he was promoted and he got 60 pounds. But he knew he could live on 28 pounds. So he, he lived on 28 and he gave 32 to the church. Then he began to write and his royalties began to earn a lot of money. And he, started, he began to earn over £1,500 a year. And what he did is he gave £1,500 to the church and he lived on £28. The principle for John Wesley was, My treasures are in heaven. My heart has been set apart. I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus. Because of these things, I look to eternity. That's what I love about Foundations for Farming. It starts with a changed heart. If we get that part right, everything works from there. I just want to finish off this morning by saying, although we often end up in different ministries, it makes me unbelievably proud when I can tell people about Foundations for Farming. 
when I can tell them all the work that you do, the influence that you have on our country and the countries around us, and I believe it's now going all over the world. What you do is the beginning of reformation, but it starts with the individual, with a, a, a heart that is consecrated to the Lord of all, who cried out on the cross, it is finished. Thanks so much for your time.